This is Limitless Spirit, a practical, inspirational, and thought-provoking weekly podcast about the impact of faith and Christian identity in today's world. And now here's your host, champion of Jesus and people who love him, world traveler and co-founder of World Missions Alliance, Helen Todd. Thank you for listening to episode 26 of the Limitless Spirit podcast. I'm excited about our topic today. We're going to talk about the art of waiting. Even the most patient person will probably say that it's something that they know they have to do, but they don't actually enjoy it. Usually, waiting is perceived at best as annoyance and at its worst, an absolute torture, depending on the importance of what you're waiting for. Yet we know that waiting is unavoidable in life. And for those who study the Word of God, we know that it is a very biblical concept. So to be able to get the most out of this necessity of waiting, it is worth digging deeper into why does God make us wait and why it is so hard for us to wait. My guest today is Brad Borain, a missionary, a professor at the Moody Bible Institute, and the author of the book on Waiting Well. In this conversation, we talk about the importance of waiting well, the unexpected treasures hidden in the waiting process, and some practical ways to make the waiting process more enjoyable. I will give you a curious hint. Complaining is part of it. Hello, Brad. Welcome to the Limitless Spirit podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. As I read the title of your book on waiting well, moving from endurance to enjoyment, I found it very intriguing. Waiting is not something people normally enjoy. And so the fact that we can actually enjoy waiting fascinated me quite a bit. So I am uh, very much looking forward to talking to you about this. But first, let me ask you this. What caused you to write a book on this subject? Well, it certainly wasn't the fact that I love waiting and know all about it. In fact, it was the opposite that led me to write the book. I hate waiting uh, just as much as you do, just as much as others do, whether I'm waiting in line at the grocery store or uh, more seriously, you know, maybe waiting for news from my doctor. I, I don't like it one bit. But I couldn't help but notice as I studied the scriptures that waiting was mentioned quite a lot. And it was mentioned in association with positive context. I mean, people were joyful when they were waiting. They were praising God when they were, you know. So I was like, wait a minute. Okay, I need to study the word in order to find out what I'm missing about waiting. So that that was the original impetus for me. Um, I needed to know why what Scripture said about waiting was so different from what I was feeling in my personal experience. Why do you think it is so hard for us to wait in general? Mm, That's a very good question. Some of the reasons are not very flattering, I'm afraid. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's it's hard for us to wait because we're pretty self-centered creatures. Um, You know, it's all about us. Another reason that it's hard to wait, I think, is is based on our North American culture. Um, We always got to be moving, always got to be producing. Uh, downtime is a bad thing. You know, if, if somebody has a down moment, boom, they look up their phone and they check somebody. They, that's, that's just part of our culture. And it, that waiting is not valued. And then we're anxious to have the results of waiting. That's another, you know, if we're waiting for news from our doctor, whether it's good news or bad news, uh, we just want to have it. And uh, so th- those are some reasons, I think, that make it uh, difficult for us to wait. In your book, you talk about the myths of waiting. So let's talk about them. What are the myths about waiting? Okay. Um, yeah, I have three myths in the book, and it's it's not that they're never true. It's just that if we only think of waiting in these terms, then we're missing a truly biblical perspective. Uh, so the three myths are, one is that waiting is always passive. Um, you know, like I'm sitting in the doctor's waiting room waiting for my name to be called, or it's it's just a nothing time. It's a down time. It's a wilderness time. It's it's not, you know, we wait is a verb, but we act like it's not a verb, like there's nothing to be done, nothing to do. 
And uh, biblical waiting is is not passive at all. There's there's things to be done, things that could be done, things that should be done, and waiting at the same time. Uh, and the second myth is that waiting is purposeless. I want to interrupt you for just one moment because sure. I, I want to expound a little bit more about waiting being active. I think it gets tricky at times. So I always think of Sarah. She she definitely believed in God's promise that she's going to have a son. And then there was that period of waiting. And so she then decides to do something about it because she was just tired of waiting. And as we know, it didn't turn out very well, her plan. (laughs) Quite true. So I think that this is one of the challenges of waiting is how do we know whether we're supposed to do something or we're supposed to do nothing? Oh, that's a that's a good point. When I say that waiting being passive is a myth, that's not to say that you know any action is better than waiting. That's not true. What I'm trying to say is that whatever you do, if if you do anything, it should be a step of faith, right? So when Sarah was waiting in faith, not trying to manipulate things, not laughing. That was the, the attitude that she should have taken. It's when she decided to take matters into her own hands and stopped exercising faith in God's promise. Because just as surely as when she laughed behind the tent, when she took matters into her own ma- hands with her handmaid Hagar, uh, that was a lack of faith. So the action that we definitely should always take is to stand firm in faith. That's not a passive thing. That's a struggle. It takes effort. It was quite difficult for Abraham and Sarah to to maintain faith in God's promises. But it wasn't passive. Whatever it was, it wasn't a passive choice for them to make. But that doesn't mean every action is correct, right? Once they took matters into their own hands and failed to exercise faith in God, things went very wrong indeed. And in, in that sense, their actions uh, were not the correct choice in that situation. Very true, very true. So what is the second myth then? Uh, sure, the second myth is that waiting is purposeless or pointless, or that's how it feels to us. You know, the the w- Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years as a punishment for their failure to enter the promised land. And it's, it sounds kind of morbid, right? They're just sort of waiting for a whole generation to die off. Was that purposeless, pointless time of, of, of waiting. That's what it may have felt like to many of them. But God, anyway, had his purposes for the nation. And he took care of them all through that time with, with manna and in other ways. And that's something that we need to remember, that although we may feel it's purposeless, that we don't see the purpose, that we don't feel the purpose, that for God, the plan is clear. And he has a purpose in all this. And the hardest thing for us is not to know what that is. We'd like to know, I'd like to know what it is. But uh, sometimes he's not going to tell us. He doesn't have to. Sometimes his ways are higher and his thoughts are higher. And I'm not capable of understanding at this time. Sometimes he does graciously reveal his purposes to us. And that, that usually helps a lot with our ability to wait in faith and wait successfully. But this myth says, hey, it doesn't actually matter how you feel. God has a purpose, even if you don't know what it is, especially if you don't know what it is. Well, and in this respect, I'm thinking sometimes waiting for something that is not even going to happen in your lifetime, like what many patriarchs of faith have experienced. Hebrews 11, right? The chapter for the Hall of Fame for those. Yeah, They, they saw it from afar off. They saw it coming, but they never, that day never came. And for us, too, we are eagerly awaiting the second coming of Christ. And will it happen in our lifetime? We don't know. Many generations of Christians have hoped and prayed that it would be in their lifetime, but they died or, uh, you know, they passed on before that day has arrived. And, And maybe I will, too. I don't know. But while I'm waiting, it's not a passive thing. It's not a purposeless thing. It's part of what it means to be a Christian in this world at this time. 
Very true. And the number three? Sure. Myth number three is, is a harder one, and that is that waiting is always painful. It's not a myth that waiting is painful. I want to make that clear. It's, it's a myth that waiting is always and inevitably and only painful. Waiting is sometimes painful. I remember when we were living in Vietnam, we had just started a new school year, and uh, we got news that my mother had uh, been diagnosed with cancer. And uh, we wanted very much to go home and be with her and support her and pray for her. And uh, she told us, don't you dare. <laughs> she said, you need to be where God has called you. Keep doing your teaching and ministry. And um, you know, we'll keep you in the loop. But it was uh, emotionally for us and physically for her painful to be in that particular season of waiting, especially at a distance. But that's not all it was. And if we had focused only on the circumstances or only on the medical diagnoses, we would have, in fact, sort of made an idol out of our pain. In the Bible, uh, waiting, the, the, like the psalmist, they express their pain to the Lord very bluntly. They will say, Lord, where are you? <laughs> You know, you're silent. I, I, I'm surrounded by my enemies. I'm betrayed by my friends. Things are not going well. I'm hurting. All my, you know, my bones are melting. They have all these colorful metaphors for their pain. But they never stop there. The Psalms always go on. And even before they're rescued or before God has formally answered their prayer, they praise him. You, you are my rock. You are my refuge. You've helped me in the past. I know you'll help me in the future. I will yet see your goodness in the land of the living. You, you know, whatever is happening in this situation, and I don't understand, still I trust that you are merciful, you are loving, you are covenant keeping. And these truths are larger than our particular moments of personal pain. That's one reason I dedicated the book to my mother as someone who has taught me a lot about true biblical waiting. This is very beautiful. And, you know, in the beginning, we were talking about the reasons why it is so hard for us as humans to wait. And we were talking about expectations. And I think, you know, as we are in this process of waiting to, to see our expectations materialize, God replaces those expectations with something else, basically just demonstrating his goodness that sometimes exceeds anything that we can be expecting of him. Absolutely. He, he, I mean, he always has many purposes, I think, and, and most of them I can't understand or I don't understand at this time. But one of these purposes is certainly always to draw us nearer to himself and to show us more of himself and to spur us to, to deeper faith in him. The kind of faith like Job had, where he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And of course, I have, have suffered nothing as much as Job did. And uh, so, so surely I can imitate his example and bless the name of the Lord, no matter what my particular circumstances are at the moment. We we're eager in our humanness, we're eager to get done with waiting, to get it over with. <laughs> you know, that's the only good thing about waiting is when it stops kind of thing. But God is not in such a hurry. Uh, waiting is part of his plan for us. I mean, the Bible even describes God himself as waiting, uh, waiting for the full number uh, to come in. And that's why he patiently waits and, and doesn't just bring an end to history right now. He wants more to be saved. And so in some mysterious, eternal way, God waits too. Well, and I was thinking that us developing that virtue of patience and us waiting patiently on the Lord is the mirror reflection of Him waiting patiently on us. <laughs> so that would be imitating us, imitating the character of our Lord. It, it totally makes sense in that respect, why it's so important as part of our Christian character. Uh, developing abso the absolutely. And, you know, in this, as in everything, of course, uh, Christ is our example. He knew His life purpose from the beginning. He knew that he was heading for the cross and resurrection, and he did his best to 
to prepare his disciples for that day. Um, but there's a sense in which you think, well, if you know that's where it's going, why not just hurry up and get there? But if you look in the exactly. Gospels, Jesus, Jesus is always saying, no, it's, I'm waiting on my Father's timing. I'm absolutely obedient to my Father. It's not yet time. This is not yet happening. He walked through his life, his public ministry years that are recorded in the Gospels, with such an incredible orientation of waiting on the Father, uh, even though you know he knew that the whole thing was going to climax in this painful time of suffering and redemption, and that uh, that needed to happen exactly and precisely on the Father's timetable and no other way. And there are so many times in the gospel when he was tempted by Satan, by his disciples or by the crowds to do something else, to hurry things along. Even his own brothers encouraged him to rush things a little bit. Maybe they were mocking him. Probably they were mocking him. You know, Jesus steadfastly refused that temptation and patiently waited on the Father to know the right time to do things. In your own life, what are some of the most valuable things that you have learned in the process of waiting on something? Mm. One of the most valuable things I've learned about waiting, honestly, is that I can't do it. <laughs> I mean, I cannot, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, I... Anytime I think I can do it in my own strength, uh, crash and burn. So the most valuable, I, I think it's the most valuable lesson I have learned in this regard, is that waiting on the Lord is the same as depending on him utterly. Um, I think about a verse like Isaiah forty thirty one. Probably many, many of your listeners on this podcast will have memorized this verse. At least I hope they have. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. You know, I look at that verse and we skip right over the verb. The verb is wait. The NIV actually turned it into hope because waiting with expectation. So they decided to go ahead and translate it hope. But uh, literally, and in most translations, it is it is waiting on the Lord. You know, if I were to write that verse, it would say something like, those who wait on the Lord will grit their teeth and get through this thing. And, you know, and when the Lord rescues us, then we will rejoice and soar on wings like eagles and all that other good stuff. But that's not what the verse says. It says, while you're waiting, the Lord renews your strength. And what does that feel like? It feels like soaring on wings like eagles. That's while you're waiting. That's not at the end. That's not when God rescues you. It's not when the waiting is done. It's in the middle of the waiting. Now, how is that even possible? Because it's not your strength, it's his. And, you know, you're still in the situation. In that uh, particular verse, the people were still in the situation waiting on God to act. And yet, because of him and his strength that they had access to through waiting on him in faith, they didn't have to wait to feel better. They were soaring on wings like eagles. They were running and not becoming weary and walking and not becoming faint because God's strength never runs out. If I tried to do that on my own strength, you know, I'd be like Icarus, <laughs> um, who maybe you know the story. He flew towards right. the, you know, the sun and uh, the wax melted off his pathetic little wings and he fell into the ocean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be me. Um, but with, with God's strength, even in terrible circumstances where we really need God to rescue us or do something on our behalf, in the middle of it, we can still, through faith, soar on wings like eagles. And that's not me. That's not you. That's not any of us. But that's the power of truly waiting on the Lord. And it's not, it's not denying the pain. You know, the people didn't say, everything's all better now. <laughs> Um, neither did the psalmist, neither did any of uh, like Jeremiah and Lamentations. Um, they didn't den deny. They weren't singing. What's that little song? I'm inside, upside, upside, downside, happy all the time. <laughs> uh, real Christians aren't like that, right? We have a full range of emotions. But waiting on the Lord renews our strength no matter what our circumstances. So that's the recurring lesson for me. I'd like to say I learned that lesson and boom, I'm done with it and I'm good to go. 
But the truth is that that lesson that I'm not enough, that I need to depend on the Lord all the times in all circumstances, is a lesson I'm constantly relearning. This is very interesting because I have not thought of this verse, and of course I've read it uh, many, many times. I have not focused on the weight part of that word verse <laughs> because yeah, we skip right over it. Weighting is not my strength either. It it really uh, presented it for me in a new light, and and it totally makes sense. Which brings me to my next question: Is it really possible to start enjoying waiting? And and what are we supposed to do to come to that state of spiritual enlightenment? <laughs> Yes. Well, I'm going to say, uh, yes, it, it is possible because we have models in Scripture of people who have learned to wait like that, particularly in the Psalms, particularly in the, in the Book of Lamentations, right? These, these, um, these real people, whether David or Jeremiah or some of the Psalms are by unknown writers, they start out expressing their pain. Uh, they start out, uh, maybe it's personal pain. You know, for Jeremiah, it was lamenting the, the fall of Jerusalem and the burning of the gates of Jerusalem. He's taking his questions to the Lord. And God is big enough for all that, all those questions, all that pain. And, and as you, especially as you read through the book of Lamentations, you know where we're going. Everybody knows that verse in uh, Lamentations 3. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Well, you know what? He didn't start off with that in chapter one or chapter two. It took him, you know, three and a half chapters to get to the point where he was ready finally to say, Your mercy, you know. Now, Jerusalem hadn't been magically restored. The Israelites were still in exile. And yet he had come to the point in his worship where his faith was restored and strong enough to say, Thy mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm going to say that even though I'm still in the midst of this time of waiting. And it's not me trying to psych myself into a better mood, right? It's not just human optimism. It, that feeling of joy and hope is a true pro product of waiting on the Lord in a faith-filled manner. So is it possible Yes, because I, I see models of it in Scripture. How to get there? Yeah, I don't have a, a, a three-step <laughs> uh, prescription for that, but the best thing I can do is to recommend that you follow those examples that are put there in Scripture for us. So many of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. So, you know, when people ask me this question, I say, take whatever you're, what are you waiting on now? Because everybody's waiting on something something small, something big. I, and so they tell me what they're waiting on now. And I say, okay, complain to the Lord. <laughs> and they're like, what? We're allowed to complain to the Lord? And I said, yeah, scripture's full of complaints to the Lord. Tell him what you're feeling. Tell him what's happening. And, but, you know, tell him because he loves you and he knows this situation and he wants to hear from you and he's got a plan for your good. But go ahead and tell him all your thoughts and feelings and from an orientation of faith, that leads to praise and worship and unexpectedly renewing our positive feelings because they're now based in something real, God's character, not based in something temporary like our circumstances or even our own natural personality and disposition to be sad or gloomy or happy or whatever the best grounds of our emotional life is in God himself. God has emotions. Christ became one of us. They understand what we're feeling, what we're going through. And as we cry out to them in the same way that the psalmist did or the prophets did as a kind of worship, that leads also to joy and hope. And the our feelings change along the way. So if people don't feel like they can do that, I say, take the words of Scripture itself. Take a psalm and make it your own. Use the words of Scripture that have been given to us for private and public worship. And do it in an attitude of faith and openness. I mean, you can even tell God, I don't, 
have words of my own. I don't know how long this time of waiting is going to take. <laughs> my feelings are pretty negative right now. Uh, you seem silent. You seem uncaring. You know, just the, guess what? The psalmists have said it all already. So follow their example. Even take their language if you need to. Lament and worship. And it leads to, to even stronger faith. And I think it also leads us to acquire the ability to enjoy God outside of our expectations. That even when things are not going the way that we want them to, even when our needs are not yet met or our desires are not yet fulfilled, God is still good. And uh, that is important for our future in eternity with Him because so many things that we will experience in eternity will be not what we're expecting at all. <laughs> so Amen to uh, that. I think that um, starting to separate his goodness from our uh, very imperfect expectations is a great preparation for eternity. Yes. I mean, this issue of expectations has, has come up a couple of times in our conversation, and I, I think you're exactly right. God is trying to change our expectations partly because our expectations are too low and they're certainly too incomplete. They're too limited. He's not Santa Claus. He's not our personal genie. He's not a vending machine, but he loves us and has a, our good in mind and he has a perfect plan. And, you know, mostly what we need to do is give up these expectations. From our point of view, maybe these expectations are reasonable or they don't, they're the only thing possible. But from God's point of view, there are so many other possibilities that we, you know, above all, we can ask or imagine, as the verse says. And if we can surrender those expectations, put them aside, and just seek to know God better, um, instead of, uh, you know, I mean, he wants us to come to him with anxieties and needs, but he's also not our personal vending machine. And what he always wants us to want, and the prayer that he will always answer, is more of him. Draw near to him. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. One thing have I desired, only one, and that's to worship in the presence of the Lord. You know, um, the, the Psalms are a constant in reinforcing this theme. Our, our desires, our expectations are wrong or not enough or finite or weak or inaccurate or improper. But they're, all, they're never going to be identical with what God wants for us. And wouldn't we rather have what God wants for us than the pathetic little whatever that we want for us? Absolutely. Well, with this pandemic, our lives have been literally put on pause. <laughs> so I think the entire world has found themselves in the time of waiting. If nothing else, with our lives going back to normal, or maybe we will never go back to what normal used to be, and we will be in the new normal. It seems like we're waiting for, um, for some people, it's for their jobs to resume, for others to their schedules, travel, events to resume. So how is your book going to help people who are in that process of waiting right now? My hope is that those who read this book uh, in, in the time of pandemic may just pause for a moment and look at the whole idea of waiting differently. Instead of hurrying to rush through it and be done with it, maybe they can, with the help of scripture, see some greater transcendent purpose. Maybe God's trying to get our attention here. Maybe he wants more of us. And, you know, by maybe, I mean definitely, <laughs> because God always wants those things. I'm a little dismayed, honestly, to see people in such a hurry to recreate their old lives. This is the perfect chance for us to reflect on how we live and maybe question some of our choices, question the wisdom, question the purposes, question how we spend our time. This is a perfect chance to make some 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 major changes as individuals, as families, as churches. Our culture is such a busy, busy culture. But instead, everybody is so anxious to get back to normal, uh, anxious to re recreate things using Zoom or technology. Uh, we have not accepted this time of waiting as a gift from God. 
Um, instead, we're we're trying to ignore it and 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 get back to normal, and that that does dismay me somewhat. But yeah, I, I would hope that the book would, uh, whether it was a time of waiting for the pandemic as it is, or just normal life if we ever get back to that, because yeah, I don't know if we will either. I hope that it would cause people to kind of stop and take a second look at their lives, at the experience of waiting, because God has so much more for us in this experience. We're selling him short. We're not taking advantage of it. I mean, we could be soaring on wings like eagles instead of trudging through the desert uh, because we're looking down instead of up. And I mean, that's all I have for people is I have God and his word, and I just want to show them how God and his word could change their experience of waiting. God will change their experience of waiting if they can take their eyes off the the circumstances and whatever small thing is worrying them at any given time. It, it may not feel small, um, but in from from God's point of, pick, uh, of view, it really is because He's bigger and more powerful and more loving and wiser than any trouble you can name. As Brad and I were talking, I remember the story about a problem that occurred in a high-rise office building in Manhattan when the tenants complained to the supervisor, the building supervisor, that they have to wait excessively long in lines to get on the elevator, whether it was the morning, their lunch break, or in the evening. So when the engineers examined the building, they determined that there was nothing that could be done to change things. And so uh, the manager of the building, who was desperate to keep the tenants, he turned to his staff for suggestions. And one of the employees mentioned that as people were waiting, they were probably just bored. So he recommended installing floor-to-ceiling mirrors near the elevator so that people could look at themselves while they're waiting. Once that was done, the complaints disappeared. I think there's a great spiritual parallel in this example. Waiting becomes annoying and at times excruciating when we see no meaning in it. When God makes us wait, it is an invitation to look into the most perfect divine mirror. And as we wait for him, we see him waiting patiently on us to align our image to his image, our expectations with his expectations, and our strength with his strength. Now, suddenly, the waiting season doesn't seem so bad. I encourage you to check Brad Borain's book on waiting well. I believe it will be helpful for many in their waiting season. Check the link in our show notes. Uh, He mentioned that his book is available in the bookstores and probably on Amazon. In the show notes, we have the link to his website. I thank you for listening to this podcast. And if you enjoy Limitless Spirit, consider supporting us by going to rfwma.org slash forward give. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Limitless Spirit with Helen Todd, produced by World Missions Alliance. Are you ready to step out of your comfort zone? Do you have a passion to help people and share your faith across the globe? Visit our website, rfwma.org, and get involved in the Great Commission through short-term missions. We hope you'll leave a review and check out other episodes. We'll be with you in a week on our next episode of Limitless Spirit.